It's wonderful that we added nearly 5 million jobs, which is 40% uh, more than the, than the uh, expectations were. That's fantastic. But these numbers, if there's a nit to pick, it seems to me, it's that these numbers were plucked from the middle of the month before we started to see a major rise in case count and some of the slowdowns and backing offs of reopening around the country. So, Ty, you make an excellent point that these numbers uh, do not accurately reflect uh, the pain that the American people are feeling. And let's put these numbers in more of a historical context. Uh, at 11 percent, uh, that unemployment rate is higher than the highest employment unemployment rate during the Great Recession of 10 years ago. Uh, let's also uh, indicate that that 11 percent unemployment rate does not count the 6 million Americans who are now working part-time, who want to work full-time, or the 4 million Americans who've had their pay slash. Uh, the number does not even, if we look at the context of 4 million jobs, what does that mean? Uh, that means that with last month and this month, we're still just one-third of the way back to where the economy was in February. So I think that uh, the hoopla is not well-placed. The economy is still suffering. We're going to see GDP growth declines of a significant mark, significant level in both the second quarter and the third quarter. And now we have spikes in 30 states, which will slow down the recovery. What does this mean? Additional stimulus by the Federal Reserve and mainly the Congress is absolutely essential as enhanced unemployment benefits run out, as cities and states that are now preparing their budgets for the next fiscal year face uh, uh, perhaps significant, uh, if you will, layoffs. So let's put the numbers in a broader context. If you just look at that 4 million in isolation, it looks great. But if you look at it in connection with all of the other things I've shared, this economy is in difficult shape. And if, as you point out, Mayor, if if there are major budget cutbacks in, for example, New York State, California, other states around the country, and layoffs in the municipal workforces, that could be a bring another wave of, of major unemployment. So I assume you would favor the passage imminently, immediately, of the HEROES Act. Which the would Heroes extend, Act among other things, should pass for two reasons. Number one, remember, municipal employees and state employees have been essential employees, frontline workers. Uh, they're people in education, people in health care, uh, people in law enforcement, people in public safety, firefighters, police officers. Uh, many of the most important public safety, public employees we have, we don't want to see layoffs there. Imagine the impact it'll have, not only on their families, mm -hmm. but also on the ability of the economy to come back uh, when it is safe for the economy to begin to return. So I think that this report has to be looked at with multiple caveats with respect to what we're facing. And we need that HEROES Act. And the, the other reason why the HEROES Act is important is it's tough to look a teacher in the eye a healthcare worker in the eye and say that the government put together a huge credit facility to assist businesses who were having liquidity challenges, that the Federal Reserve helped financial services firms uh, and clean up their balance sheets and remove non-performing assets. And then, basically, what are you going to say? Uh, well, we don't think right. we should do anything for you. So there's a, there's a moral issue here. There's an equivalency issue here with the nation in the, in the shape that it's in, to do the right thing. You know, I, I'm going to make an observation that may, may have a question embedded in it, but I'm sure you'll be able to pick up on my thought. You know, the United States has, has learned or been confronted by uh, many of the facets of inequality uh, over the past six to eight weeks. And in these numbers about unemployment, there is yet another facet, and that is that unemployment for black Americans remains four or more percentage points higher than it does for white Americans, uh, and, and four, percent, four percentage points above the national rate uh, of everyone. We've also learned through COVID about inequalities in, in health care, uh, which in part 
points to inequalities about residential living and housing. And of course, we've learned a lot about inequalities in, in, in criminal justice. Do you think that we are learning lessons that we will really apply and make changes on, these, on the economic front, on the healthcare front, on the housing front, on the criminal justice front? How do we move forward? As a nation, we must make changes. Ty, the numbers that you outline are the definition of structural racism and inequality. The fact that there's been no instance uh, in the past 50 years uh, where the black unemployment rate has equaled the white unemployment rate. No instance in the last 50 years plus, and I'm, I'm using that, that context because that's the emergence of the, the availability of really good numbers, uh, where uh, the health conditions or the life expectancies of African Americans equated that of whites. There's been no instance where the high school graduation rates, the college matriculation rates have equaled that the black rate is equal to that of whites. That's the definition. And so do we tolerate that as normal? Do we make excuses about it as a nation? Or do we confront the fact that fixing it and repairing it is not only good for African Americans, it's good for the nation at large. It improves the economy. It creates GDP and productivity. And that's what I think uh, investors and business people have to understand, tackling this issue is not only a social good, it's an economic good. 